Hello and welcome to the Modern Embedded Systems Programming course. My name is Miro Samek and in this second lesson about state machines you'll learn about guard conditions as a mechanism of making your state machines more flexible. This concept will be needed in the upcoming lessons where I'll discuss the promised other variants of state machines. As usual, let's get started by copying the previous directory for lesson 35 to lesson 36. Get inside the new Lesson 36 directory and double-click on the blinkybutton.qm model file to open it with the freeware QM modeling tool. If you don't have QM, you can download it from statemachine.com as part of the QP bundle. To remind you quickly what happened so far, in the last lesson you've learned the very basics of state machines. You also designed a simple state machine for your Blinky Button application. In a nutshell, a state machine is the most optimal solution to the very common problem where a system needs to react to events not only based on the event type, but also depending on the history of past events. For example, in your Blinky Button application, the timeout event needs to trigger different reactions depending on what happened to the green LED previously. This is very elegantly handled by the off and on states in your state machine. In the OFF state, the timeout event causes turning the LED ON and the transition to the ON state to remember the LED change. In the ON state, the same timeout event causes turning the LED OFF and the transition to the OFF state to remember the LED change. So this is how the reaction to an event depends on both the event signal, timeout in this case, and on the current state of the state machine. However, this is still not quite flexible enough for many real-life situations. The reason is that the whole structure of states and transitions in a state machine is fixed at design time. But what if the behavior, that is the reactions to future events, depends on the user input, which is obviously not known until runtime? This means that for certain transitions you cannot know at design time which state to transition to. To address this need, the UML state machine notation includes the so-called choice, pseudo-states and guard conditions. The whole idea is actually very simple and is a way of combining a decision point from a flowchart with the transition notation. Specifically, a transition can go into a choice pseudo-state depicted as a diamond. Out of this diamond shape, you can have several outgoing transition segments each labeled with a guard condition depicted in square brackets. Guard conditions are simply Boolean expressions evaluated at runtime. If a guard condition evaluates to true, the corresponding transition is taken. Otherwise, the transition is considered disabled, meaning that it is not taken. A special complementary guard depicted as else in square brackets evaluates to true only if all other guards from the same choice pseudostate evaluate to false. Now let me show you an application where such choice pseudostates and guards would be very useful. So suppose that you want to use your Tiva C launchpad board as a controller for a time bomb, which should work as follows. After reset, the controller lights up the green LED and waits for the user to press the button SW1. When you press the button, the board turns the green LED off and starts timing out. It blinks the red LED on and off three times, after which the bomb explodes, which you emulate by turning all three LED colors on. In other words, after the reset, green light, and after the button press, Blink, pause, blink, pause, blink, pause, boom. OK, so now let's build a state machine for this behavior. Again, just as in the previous lesson 35, I will use the QM visual modeling tool with the previous blinky button model as my starting point for the time bomb. I will save the model as timebomb.qm And I will also rename the active object to time bomb. So now, as you remember, the initial transition should turn the green LED on and transition to a state where the time bomb waits for the user to press the button. Let's name this state wait for button. 
Inside the wait for button state, the only event of interest is the button pressed, so we can get rid of the other events. The button pressed event needs to perform the following actions. Turn the green LED off, turn the red LED on, arm the time event to expire in one half second, and transition to the blink state. Because as you remember, button press should be followed by blink. In the blink state you can get rid of all events except timeout that you just armed on the transition to this state. The timeout event needs to turn the red LED off, arm the time event for another one half second, and transition to the pause state. Because as you remember, blink is followed by pause. In the pause state you also need to handle the just armed timeout event to get ready for another blink. But wait a minute, where should you go with this transition? I mean, you cannot naively go back to blink, because that would create an endless loop of blink and pause. A brute force solution would be to add three groups of blink and pause states, because at this point the time bomb is supposed to blink just three times. But this is obviously a rather brain-dead solution, not only because there are so many states that mindlessly repeat essentially the same behavior, but also because the number of blinks is likely to change. Indeed, the next feature could very well be that the number of blinks before the time bomb goes off needs to be adjusted by the user, so you simply cannot know this number at design time. So instead, a smarter design would be to add a blink counter to the state machine that would simply count the number of blinks. Specifically, each time through the pause state, the action on the timeout event would only decrement the counter. Now you need to apply the new concept for this lesson by adding a choice pseudo state, which you need to label with a guard condition. The guard is simply a boolean expression, blink counter greater than zero. This guard means that you still have some blinking to do. So you go to the blink state. But you should not forget to also perform actions to prepare for the blink state, such as turn the red LED on and arm the time event for one half second. You also need to add the complementary else guard, which will go to the new state boom. On this transition segment you also need to perform actions to prepare for the state, such as turning all LEDs on to emulate the explosion. Of course, you still need to add the boom state and point the transition segment to it. Finally, you need to initialize the blink counter variable to the total number of blinks you wish to have. You can put it in various transitions upstream from the blink state, for example, wait for a button. Alright, so now you just need to code the state machine. Again, like in the last lesson, you'll be doing this manually, even though the QM modeling tool could generate the code for you. But at this point I haven't yet explained any other, more optimal state machine implementation strategies, so let's stick to the straightforward nested switch statement technique that you've learned in the last lesson 35. So first off, you need to rename blinky button to time bomb in your whole project. After the global replacement, you need to make some manual corrections. And actually, since this is just a name change, the project should still build cleanly. Now inside the time bomb active object, you need to enumerate the states of a state machine. These states are wait for a button, blink, pause, and boom. You also need to check the declarations of the internal private variables. You obviously need the time event, so you keep it. But instead of the blink time, you now need the blink counter data member. At this point you can delete the no longer needed initial blink time constant. But next, moving on to your state machine, you start with the initial transition. As you remember from the last time, the whole state machine implementation goes into the dispatch function. So here, for the initial transition, you turn the green LED on and transition to the wait for button state. All states of your state machine go into the switch statement, which discriminates based on the me state variable. The first such state is wait for button. 
Here you handle just the button pressed event, so you can delete all the others. The actions on button pressed turn the green LED off, the red LED on, arm your time event for one half second, and initialize the blink counter to three. After this you transition to the blink state. In the blink state you handle only the timeout event, so you can delete everything else. The actions on timeout are turn the red LED off, arm the time event for one half second, and transition to the pause state. Now the pause state is similar to blink, so I just copy and paste the blink code as my starting point for pause. The first segment of the timeout transition only decrements the private me blink counter data member. But now comes the most interesting part of coding the choice point and the guard conditions. I hope you can see that the first branch corresponds to the if statement that simply checks the guard condition. If this guard evaluates to true, you turn the red LED on, arm the time event for one half second, and transition back to the blink state. The complementary else guard corresponds then simply to the else branch of the original if. Here you turn all the LEDs on to emulate the bomb explosion, and you transition to the boom state. Finally, the boom state handles no events, so it is an empty case statement. In summary, the choice pseudo state and guard conditions turned out to be simply ifs and elses in your C code. Please note that these are exactly the same ifs and elses that the state machine was designed to eliminate in the first place. Just recall the spaghetti code from the Visual Basic Calculator example I showed you in the last lesson 35. So the moral here is that the guard conditions should be used very judiciously. Too many of them and you'll find yourself back in square one, spaghetti, where the guards effectively take over handling of all the relevant conditions in the system. On the other hand, guards are sometimes unavoidable because they add the necessary flexibility to the state machines. Therefore, one of the main challenges in becoming an effective state machine designer is to develop a sense for which parts of the behavior should be captured in states and transitions at design time, and which parts require runtime flexibility of guard conditions. Generally, you should challenge yourself to use as few guard conditions as possible. Alright, so the last order of business for today is to check how your code works on the board. For this, I'll simply upload the code to the board. When I press the reset button, the green LED lights up as expected. Now when I press the SW1 button, 3, 2, 1, boom! Ok, so now let's change the blink counter to say count 10 and rebuild the code. Load the code to the board and press reset. Green light. Good. Now the button. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, boom! This concludes this lesson about guard conditions. Now you are truly ready for the next lesson, where you'll learn about the other variants of so-called input-driven or polled state machines, and how they compare to the event-driven state machines that I've been discussing so far. If you like this channel, please give this video a like and subscribe to stay tuned. You can also visit statemachine.com quickstart for the class notes and project file downloads.